in this story, I, I just see a message that if you're like me, I kind of need sometimes. That he came that we might have life and have it more abundantly. And he not only came to give us resurrection life one day, but he came to give us resurrection life today. Would you pray with me? Lord, we, um, we are just so blessed to have your word in our hands. Lord, I thank you so much that you did not ask us just to serve you mindlessly. You did not just uh, somehow kind of, you're not this uh, a far off God that's a little hard to understand, although we don't completely understand you. You've given us your word and you even sent your son, Jesus Christ, in the flesh so that we could see you close up and personal that you came as God with skin on and and you came Lord Jesus showing us what the heart of the Father was that Lord you want to interrupt all of our fallenness and and the tragedies and the difficulties of this life and in the middle of this life you want to bring us life more abundantly and Father I just acknowledge today that in myself I have nothing but I pray that by your spirit you would speak through your word and Lord, I'm just going to be so bold to ask Lord Jesus that the dead places in our lives would be resurrected this morning. That Lord, those of us that struggle with so many different issues and besetting sins that keep, keep tripping us up and we keep going back to that today, Lord, as we reach out to touch you, you would set us free and you would heal us, Lord. I'm asking for a pivotal moment in eternity to happen today on April 13th, 2014, as we just open our hearts to your work. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Well, let's go ahead and, um, well, let me give you a little bit of background first. Um, one of the things that I find so interesting about Jesus, and as we're coming up to Easter, that he told his disciples over and over that Easter was going to happen. Did you realize that? Do you know that he said, listen, guys, this is what's going to happen. The Son of God is going to be handed over. He's going to be crucified, and he's going to die. And then he's going to raise three times, three, three times. Oh, my goodness. He's going to rise on the third day. He told them that. In fact, seven times in the, the chapter, in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus makes it clear. This is what's going to happen. Anyone ever just sort of go, yeah, yeah, God, whatever. But I, this is how I want it to be. Have, have you ever done that? I know I do. I, I, God says, Joanna, this is, you know, you may have to walk through struggles. Oh, praise God, I'm more than a victor. I don't have to have anything bad happen to me. Right? I, he says, the Bible says, listen, you're perfected through your suffering just like the Son of God was. And we're like, yeah, I rebuke that in the name of Jesus. Because I don't want that. I want the good news. I want resurrection. I want the testimony. I don't want to have to go through the cross to get there. I don't want to have to go through the difficult times to have the image of Christ shaped in my life. I, I just want the magic wand and poof, I want to arrive. And yet Jesus says, listen, there's a process and, and it's a process that I'm going through so that you can have life and life more abundantly. So he tells the disciples, they just sort of dismiss it. Uh, and then when he's crucified, you know the story, they're all in dismay. They can't believe what has happened because here's the deal. They had in mind that Jesus was going to come and set up an earthly kingdom, right? Jesus was going to overthrow the Rome, Rome and he was going to set up his kingdom and they were pretty sure that they were going to sit on the right and they were going to sit on the left and they were going to rule with Jesus. Woohoo! It was going to turn out just the way they wanted it to even though Jesus said so clearly, that's not how it's going to happen tells him that and then three different times in scripture he actually proves his power over death and one of those stories is the story we're going to study this morning but the first one is found in Luke chapter 7 verses 1, 11 through 17 where Jesus is on his way he sees a funeral procession it's a widow woman her only son is dead they're carrying him in a coffin Jesus stops says the word the young man sits up that would be exciting wouldn't it just sits up and he's made fully alive Jesus proves that he has power over death. And then, of course, my favorite story about his resurrection power is John chapter 11, where he raises Lazarus from the dead. But I want to share and really focus on the story of Jairus' daughter 
found in three Gospels, Matthew 9, 18 through 26, Mark 5, 21 through 43, and Luke 8, 41 through 46. And so, as we prepare to go to that scripture, I'd like to just, as we look at that story, I'd like to just read this as is found in Matthew 9. Verse 18, while he was saying this, a ruler came and knelt before him and said, my daughter has just died, but come and put your hand on her and she will live. Jesus got up and went with him and so did his disciples. Just then a woman who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak. She said to herself, if I only touch his cloak, I will be healed. Jesus turned and saw her, and he said these words, Take heart, daughter. Your faith has healed you. And the woman was healed from that moment. Now when Jesus entered the ruler's house and saw the flute pay players and the noisy crowd, he said, Listen, go away. The girl is not dead, but asleep. But the people laughed at him. After the crowd had been put outside, Jesus went in, took the girl by the hand, and she got up, and news of this spread throughout the region. Now what's interesting is that we not only have a story of resurrection, but we got a story within a story about resurrection. And I'd like to unpack that today because I just saw some amazing things. Because, first of all, I want you to consider this. You've got two people with a problem. You've got Jairus, who is the ruler of the synagogue we find in other Gospels. We're told in other Gospels that he, that he has a daughter who he loves dearly. He's well known, he's well connected, and yet the woman in the middle of the story is really forgotten and anonymous. We don't even know her name. One was wealthy. According to other, um, other versions of the story in the other Gospels, the woman who had the issue of bleeding had spent all the money she had. She was living in poverty. One was well-known, one was forgotten. One was wealthy, one lived in poverty. One was a leader in the synagogue, while the other, because of her problem, was not even allowed to worship in the synagogue. As I studied that out more, I saw another little interesting parallel. For 12 years, Jairus had enjoyed his only child, the light of his life. For 12 years, the unnamed woman had suffered in her body. Isn't, isn't that interesting? Two different people living on two different, different sides of society. Jairus, because of his position perhaps and perhaps of the confidence that it engendered in him, came directly to Jesus, fell at his feet and said, Lord, would you come? Would you heal my daughter? The other woman, so despised because she was considered unclean by the religious elite, uh, the issue that she had made her on the outside looking in. She was so... So uh, worried, perhaps, so unused to having the permission to come even into the presence of religious people, she secretly came to Jesus. Let's look at that. I want to look at it a little bit more in the book of Mark, chapter 5, because it gives some really interesting details. As I told you, Jairus was a desperate so father with a sick daughter, and yet, this synagogue ruler, who may or may not have believed in Jesus, perhaps he'd kind of been part of those that had thought that, well, you know, he's making a lot of claims and there's no way of knowing it. But have you noticed how desperation tends to strip away all of our prejudice? You know, here's the synagogue ruler, supposedly with the direct connection with God, but all of his good works, all of his religious wisdom, it did him nothing. It was no good. And he came to the bottom and, and to the end of himself, and he realized, I need more than what I got. And he ran to Jesus, and then he humbled himself, the scripture says. He fell at his feet. Now, in math, in, let's look at this in Mark chapter 5, because we find a couple of interesting things. Verse 22, then one of the synagogue rulers came there, 
fell at his feet, pleading in, in, uh, earnestly. Let me just point out something. Um, what he says here is, my daughter is dying. Interestingly, Matthew just says that his daughter was dead. Do you ever run across stuff in Scripture where you go, wait a minute, why does, why does Matthew say that she's dead and Mark say that she was dying? Uh, what I love about this word is that it is the inspired word of God written by men written by people. And so in the Gospels, sometimes we'll find those little discrepancies. And because have you ever noticed that if you're standing on a street corner and all of a sudden there's an accident and you tell your version of what you see, it'll be different than what the person across the other side of the street saw. And, and as a writer, I find it really, really comforting that actually this word was not tidied up in editing right? In fact, rather than diluting the authority of God's word, to me, it actually confirms it. God lets holy men give their, their um, version of what they saw and what they heard. And so he, perhaps it's also because the book of Matthew is sort of a synopsis. It's shorter, and, and so they just wanted to kind of uh, consolidate the facts. But Mark 5 tells us that the daughter was dying, was dying. Ah, and, G and Jairus says, please come, and the Bible tells us, so Jesus went with him. But here's where the second story intercepts the first story in Mark 9, 24. Excuse me, 5, 24. A large crowd followed and pressed around him, and a woman who had been there, subject to bleeding for 12 years. Listen to this. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. Grew worse. But she thought this in her heart. She said, verse 28, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. And verse 29 says, immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she'd been freed from her suffering. <laughs> you know, I, I was thinking about this whole exchange and I thought the issue she had was this, this hemorrhaging. But how many of us have issues? Issues that we've struggled with for years. Anybody? You know, it's like, man, why do I keep struggling with this issue? Why, why even though I've tried everything I can to get over it, I still am in this predicament? You know, I, I wonder if this woman, I wonder if she didn't wrestle a little bit within herself and say, you know, I've tried everything else. I, I, I'm sure that won't work. You know, I'm just going to have to settle for where I am in life. But instead, something rose within her heart, and she pressed in, and she touched Jesus and she was healed. Can I just introduce the first principle that I see in this story within a story? Number one, no matter what end of the spectrum, no matter what side of society you find yourself on, you are important to God. Now, I don't know about you, but I would have thought, oh, well, this is synagogue ruler. Uh, Jesus is going to help his daughter. I don't want to bother him. But but instead, this woman, she, she reached through. But here's the beautiful thing that I want to bring out. The moment she touched his garment, the Bible tells us Jesus felt power go out. And he stopped what he was doing. On an important mission to help an important man, he stopped where he was and he said, who touched me? Who touched me? And in other uh, tellings of the story, it said that the crowd was so thick around him, it literally crushed him. And the disciples said, what are you talking about who touched you? Lots and lots of people have touched you, but there was only one person who had touched him with faith. And that faith released the power of God. And at that very moment, she was healed. And rather than going, well, you know, something happened. Not sure what that was about, you know, except that he was omnipotent, all-knowing God. He knew. But he stopped in the middle of an important thing. Can I say that you are important enough to God to pause what he's doing and to meet your need? He loves you that much. And then he not only finds out who it is that touched him, but he has this beautiful exchange that I'm going to talk about later, 
where he actually talks to this woman as she tells him her story. You matter to God. I don't care how long it's been. I don't, I don't care how often you've asked. You matter to God. And as I was thinking about this morning, I was thinking about how Scripture tells us to, to ask and to knock and to seek. And if you look at the original language, I know you've heard it before, but it means keep on knocking. Keep on asking. Keep on seeking because here's the reality your miracle might be just one moment away just one moment away and yet if you're like me I can get so overwhelmed by hopelessness and helplessness I can even get I can even get hard into my heart and I can say you know well I asked before I'm not gonna ask again and yet I believe that this morning God may be stirring a faith in you like he stirred in that woman. Something that says, if I can just touch him, I will be made well. I'm asking for that kind of faith in my life. I am so sick and tired of living under the circumstances and believing that this is all there is that I never really do the hard work of reaching Jesus, not only for my life, for the life of those I love. I kind of settled for this fatalistic, well, you know, whatever will be, will be. And yet in this story, we see that there's something about tenacious faith that touches the heart of God. Don't give up seeking. Don't give up asking. Don't give up knocking because you are important to God. But meanwhile, back in that first story, after Jesus had this incredible, beautiful encounter with this woman and she was healed, word came in verse 35, listen to this, verse 35, while Jesus was still speaking to the woman, some men came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue ruler, and here's what they said. I mean, talk about unfeeling and really bad bedside manner. They say, he's, they say these words, listen, your daughter is dead. And then they say this phrase, why bother the teacher anymore? Have, have you ever had something happen in your life where, where you know you just figure, I, I'm not going to even bother God anymore with it. it? It's hopeless, it's done, it's over. I'm not going to bother God anymore. That's what the enemy of your soul wants to say to you. In fact, I would say he loves to come to you and he loves to say, that place in your life, it's dead. There's no hope. It's over. Don't bother God. Don't bother believing. Don't even, listen, don't even bother living because the life is, that you wanted is over. Just, just shut down, close off, hold on to the end because even in the middle of your death, there is no possibility of life. One of the things that we face in our world today is that sometimes our tombs don't open. Have you ever had that happen? Where, where the answer is not yes. The answer seems to be no. And, and we do have to deal with the fact that, that, that what I had wanted may not happen. But can I tell you, oh, can I tell you today that in the middle of the death of what you dreamed of and what you wanted, there is resurrection life. There is resurrection life. And I fear so many of us, we just feel like we're, we're not loved by God. We've been forgotten by him. And yet I want you to know that today he wants to come to that dead place in your heart, that place where you thought, why bother? Why bother? Why bother even believing? God. And can I, I think this, a lot of us feel this, why even bother praying? Didn't work before? Hmm. I just feel like the Lord is saying, listen, something happens in prayer, even when it doesn't turn out the way you want, that you need every single day of your life. And when you allow the enemy of your soul to believe the lie, why bother God? You're missing out on the miraculous, and you're missing out on the abundant life he came to give. 
your daughter is dead. As I was thinking about it, I thought, I, if I put myself in the place of, Laz, of, of Jairus, I would have to think, wait, what? <laughs> My daughter is dead? And then I begin to try to figure out, well, well, what if we would have hurried faster? What if that woman hadn't touched Jesus? And more importantly, what if Jesus hadn't stopped and talked to her? Just let the power go out of you and let's get on with my life. <laughs> right? <laughs> Have you ever had God answer someone else's questions and someone else's prayers while you were still waiting for the, your answer? I have. And sometimes, sometimes that can cause a resentment in our soul. And yet I love the words that Jesus says. Listen to these words. Verse 30. Wow, I'm getting to where I need better contacts. Thank you. Um, why bother the teacher anymore? That's what the men said. Look at verse 36. Oh, I love this. I love this. This can preach. This can preach. Ignoring what they said. Ignoring what they said, Jesus said, told the synagogue ruler, don't be afraid, just believe. Here comes the people saying, it's impossible, your daughter is dead, why bother the teacher? And I can just see Jesus going, Jairus, Jairus, look, no, no, look at me. Look at, don't look at them, look at me. Don't be afraid, just believe. And can I just tell you that there are times where Jesus has to say those words to my heart so that I'll shut out the mockers and the disbelievers in me. In me. My own belief, disbelief. He has to say, no, 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 Joanna, ignore that. Ignore the hopelessness. Ignore the despair. Look at me. And what I say to you, Joanna, is this. Don't be afraid. Just believe. I feel like there's someone here this morning that needs this word. Don't be afraid. I know it looks hopeless. I know it feels like it's impossible. But Jesus is ignoring all of that because I, I already showed you. He is Lord over death. And he is Lord over every single thing that wants to destroy you and dismantle you. He is the God of resurrection. So don't be afraid. Just believe. <laughs> but I want to, and I should have inserted this verse, the principle number one is that you matter to God, but after those people said, why bother the teacher, I want to insert this principle number two, you are never a bother to God. You are never a bother to God. You know, there's some people who go, well, I, you know, it just doesn't seem important enough to pray about. You know, I know other people have much worse problems than I do. Can I tell you there is nothing too small, there is nothing too big that you cannot bring to your Father. You are never a bother to God. Never a bother to God. Verse 38, they get to the house. Interestingly, Jesus said, it says in verse 38, they saw, he saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. Listen, the mourning was in full force. In fact, in the Jewish culture, they would, they would hire musicians. Uh, I believe it's Luke tells us that there were flute, or, flute players playing, and there were, there were mourners wailing. If you didn't have enough friends to come wail at your funeral, you'd hire them. How would you like that for a job? You know, honey, I'll see you at 5 o'clock. i got to go wail. <laughs> now, and there was so much commotion, and Jesus comes through, through all of the sorrow and all of the grieving and all of the mourning. And he says, listen, listen, the little girl's not dead. She's just asleep. And they're like, yeah, right. She is most definitely dead. And can I just tell you, Jesus knew that her life, as we know it, was over. But to him, that was no obstacle at all. All he had to say was just shake her and wake her up. She's just asleep. And you may have something that you feel has been dead and gone for so long. And the Lord would say, no, 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 that dream, that dream's not dead. It's just asleep. And in my timing and in, with my words, I'll bring back to life that thing that has been forgotten. I'll bring back to life that thing that you've lost. 
verse 41 tells us this. He took her by the hand, and then he said these words, Talathakum, which means little girl, I say to you, get up. Look for verse 42. Immediately, the girl stood up and walked around. And then I love verse 43. He told them to give her something to eat. Is that tender? Is that tender? Here's this little girl. She's been sick and she's been dying. She's not only healed, but Jesus cares so much about her. He says, give her something to eat. Maybe it's because it's Sunday morning and I'm hungry, but that ministers to me. The tender love of Jesus. From these two stories, I believe we be, find two important steps on the pathway to our miracle. Number one, press in and reach out to Jesus. Don't let disappointment taint your faith. Can I be honest that I, I struggle with that sometimes? Because I haven't experienced the miraculous in the past, sometimes I stop believing the miraculous for my present. Sometimes because God doesn't always behave the way I want him to do, and I, I get disappointed, I, I, just, I just sort of say, well, this is all there is, and this is how it is. And I never reach in and take all that he wants to give me. You know, she tried so many things. It would have been easy to give up. But faith arose in her heart. And I believe that God wants to birth faith in each of our hearts. We're, you know, it's not, the, it's not the kind of faith that says, I want him to do it, and so I believe he's going to do it. But that kind of faith where you just sense him going, there's more, there's more. I want to do something in you, Joanna. I want to do something. And you feel that faith arise. And he says, he wants us to reach out. And, and here's the thing, the woman had to literally crawl through the crowd. And you may have to crawl through your doubt and your apathy and your fear and your helpless disappointment. You may have to do something to reach out. But today, reach out and touch Jesus. Because from this story, we find out that God's power is released by our touch of faith. In fact, Jesus said in verse 34, your faith has healed you. Your faith is healed to you. Let him stir something new in you today. Number two, don't be afraid. Just believe. His words to Chiris. I've needed those words a lot over these last year or so as I've tried to do something that is so beyond me. And he's saying, Joanna, don't look at what you see. Don't look at your own inadequacies. Don't be afraid. Just believe believe because Luke 18 27 says what's po impossible with men is possible with God in verse 40 when he got there and when he had said that she's only asleep and the people had laughed and scorned him it, it says in other versions of this story through the Bible that he put them outside he put out the mockers and I am telling you we need to start taking authority over the doubt of our own minds and we need to say you know what I don't know how I don't know when I don't know what he's going to do but I silence my doubt and I choose to believe don't be afraid just believe but it's the response of Jesus to these two situations that have just echoed in my heart in verse 34 back when he when he was talking to the young, the, um, excuse me, the unnamed woman. Verse 33, the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. Need You need to understand, remember, she was considered unclean. What was she even doing in a crowd of people? She should have been outside the city. In fact, she was required to shout unclean because to touch her would make them unclean ceremonially unclean and yet listen to what Jesus said to this woman who'd been forgotten to this woman who for 12 years I, I need you to see this for 12 years had not known a human touch perhaps she'd been married had I don't know if her husband had divorced her I don't know if they'd had to live separated but for 12 years of unending bleeding outcast and despised and even judged by some people as it being a sign of immorality. Jesus says these words, daughter, 
Your faith has healed you. Daughter, he called her daughter. And you may be on that side of society where you have done a lot of things that you're ashamed of. Your own guilt and your shame keeps you from reaching out and touching Jesus. But when you do, he meets you with this word, daughter. In fact, it's the only time in scripture that Jesus calls someone daughter. And it's an unnamed, outcast woman. And he's, and I can't help but read a little bit into it, and I ha can't help but think that Jesus is saying, hey, you just saw my exchange with Jairus, that father's heart for his little girl. Well, daughter, that's your father's heart for you. That's your father's heart for you. And then in exchange with the little girl, he said, Talethakum. Talethakum. And I'm, that's just been echoing in my heart. Talethakum. Talethakum. And it means, according to scripture, little girl, get up, which is just so beautiful. But do you know what? It's even more tender than that. It was familiar. It was familiar to people's ears because it was the greeting that a mother woke her child with every morning. Little girl, come on, honey. Come on, honey. It's time to get up. It's time to get up. And I don't know where you've been. I don't know if you felt dead inside. I don't know if you felt like your situation is beyond hope. But he wants to speak to you in the middle of your situation. And he wants to say, it's time to get up. It's time. It's time to wake up to my love. It's time to wake up to my purposes. It's time to wake up to my acceptance and my grace. It's time, daughter, little girl, it's time to live. And I just felt this morning that the Lord wants to meet some of you this morning with that love and with that healing. And so I've asked some of our leadership team to come forward. And, and I, I just believe that Jesus is in the house. And then he wants to meet you. And so if my leadership people would come forward, I, I'm just going to begin to play. And um, I'm just going to invite you to come forward. and Because I think he's calling your name. Daughter, son, Telethakum. If you have a need this morning, I don't know what it is. Maybe it's physical healing. Maybe you felt um, kind of dead inside. And there's a faith that's kind of stirring in your heart that maybe this is the morning that God is asking you to step forward, to reach out and touch him. Maybe it's time to reaffirm your commitment to the Lord Jesus. Maybe it's time to step out of the place of death that you've lived and halfway living too, too, too long. Out of the disappointment that you've felt, the discouragement, even, <laughs> even the guilt and the shame over your issues. That Jesus is here to minister to you. Would you just come forward? If you'd like to find a place of prayer for yourself, feel free. But let's just make a movement. That unnamed woman had to reach out and touch Jesus. She had to go through, step through her pride just like Jairus did as he fell at Jesus' feet. He's here and he wants to touch you today.
you just cry out to the Lord about your need that you have? Perhaps like me, you need to ask the Lord to forgive you for the unbelief that's just kind of crept up and shut you down in your relationship with him. Maybe perhaps this morning you need to forgive God for not showing up the way you thought he would, the, thought, the way you believe you needed him. But today he's saying, I want to even heal that today. I want to heal and close that distance. I want to be your God once again. I don't want you to do life alone. Because I'm the God that heals you. I'm the God that heals you from the inside out. I know you feel, Lord, that perhaps you can't trust me, but today I'm asking you, let us be restored to relationship, too. Let me help heal your unbelief. issues, Lord, that have plagued people for so many years. Lord, we call out to you for healing. We reach out. Lord, I'm asking that this morning there would be strongholds broken, Lord, that addictions would be shattered right now in the name of Jesus, that depression would lift. Oh, God, I'm asking, Lord Jesus, the bitterness that we've held in some of our hearts, Lord, would begin to melt as we just reach out to you. Oh, God, for the grief, Lord, that has seemed to follow us and plague us, that, Lord, all of a sudden, you would give us garments of praise for the spirit of heaviness and the oil of joy for mourning. Because that's just the kind of God you are. There's no tomb that you cannot open, and there is no death that you cannot resurrect. Resurrect us, Lord. For those of us that have kind of fallen into a slumber, our hearts have gone a bit cold and a bit distant from you, Lord. Would you wake us up this morning? Would you wake us up this morning? 